My name is Doug McIntyre. I'm the Associate <coughs> Assistant Deputy Secretary of the Office of Patrol Reserves. And that's a long government title to mean that I'm the number two person in charge of that office, which, which the main thing is that we do is the Strategic Patrolling Reserve. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, moving on, quick raising. Who likes high gasoline prices? <laughs> Come on, someone, no? No one? Come on, what's wrong with y'all? So you don't like to pay you don't like to pay those gasoline prices at the pump? No? How about these? No? <laughs> okay. So how many? So I don't I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, just in your head. How many of you are old enough to remember the gasoline lines? And okay, you don't have to you don't have to identify yourselves on this one. Okay, so um Unfortunately, uh, uh, that's David's car right there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't get your permission before I showed you. So, so the, the purpose of this is to show that the, uh, the Street of Patrol and Reserve came out of the, the air of oil embargo and the subsequent uh, concern about uh, impacts of oil supply interruptions on the economy and the markets. And this is just another example of the impact. So, Almost every recession that we've had since uh, the Arab oil embargo has been uh, followed by a large price rise, or at least some price rise. So here's the one that I just showed, the Arab oil embargo. This is leading up to the Iran-Iraq uh, war of, of 1980. Um, no, this is, the Shah, this is when the Shah of Iran uh, was deposed. Um, and, and, I, and it kind of should argue that these Two were both tied to that. It was such a large, sharp rise. Here, this is uh, the the Gulf War, 1990, 91. This this not so much, but there was a little price rise. And of course, we all remember when prices got up to four dollars a gallon almost everywhere at the pump. That was a result of a, a large increase in in oil demand globally, and crude oil prices went to 145 dollars. It was really more demand driven than supply driven. But as a result, and here I'm going to also show my age here, anyone who remembers Schoolhouse Rock episodes when they, when they were young. Um, so, oh, oh I, yeah, so, so, this, so the Schoolhouse Rock, that's, that's Mr. Bill. He became a law. If, his, if he was the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, he would have become a law when President Ford signed, signed him on December 22nd, 1975. This is a copy of the law as it stands right now after numerous revisions. So sometimes you see the president on TV showing the budget and he's got like stacks of, of documents, you know, taller than himself. Uh, this, is, this is it. So, but there's a few sections in there that apply, that apply to, to, uh, to us in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and to state our mission, it's to protect the U.S. economy from severe petroleum supply interruptions through the acquisition, storage, and management of emergency petroleum stocks and to carry out U.S. obligations under the International Energy Program. And I'll touch upon some of, some of how we meet that mission uh, over the course of the next few slides. So where, what is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Where are we? So, there's, it's crude oil that's stored underground in salt caverns, and it's stored in four different locations, two in Texas and two in Louisiana. So going west to east, Bryan Mound is near Freeport. It's about an uh, hour, hour and a half south-southwest of Houston. Got Big Hill site, which is near Port Arthur, Texas, West Hackberry is by Lake Charles, and Bayou Choctaw is by Baton Rouge. The way the program operates is we have a headquarters staff of about 25 people up here in the Forrestal building on the third floor, some of which are here, here watching me today. Um, and we oversee the project management office, which is located in a suburb of New Orleans. And it sounds like, oh, that's really cool. You get to go to New Orleans. So I've been in New Orleans a few times already without ever going into the French Quarter because it's on the suburb. And there's a really cool Hampton Inns, like right across the street. 
So I've gone between the Hampton Inn and the project management office a number of times, but, but not down to the French Quarter. Um, but the project management office has about 80 feds and, an, and oversees our M&O contract, our, our maintenance operation, our management and op operations contract. That's who actually does the day-to-day -day activities of, related to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and a lot of those folks are also located at each of the sites. So again, two in Texas, two in Louisiana. Um, there's a number of caverns and storage capacity at each of the sites. And our largest site is the Bryan Mound site. Uh, that holds up to 247 million barrels of crude oil. Uh, the second largest is our West Hackberry, that's in Louisiana. That holds up to 220 plus, a little over 220 million barrels of, of crude oil. Uh, the capacity, the third largest is the Big Hill, that's the second one in Texas, that, hold, that can hold up to 170 million barrels. And the smallest is the one by Baton Rouge, by Choctaw, and that can hold up to 76 million barrels. You add all that up, we have a capacity of 713 and a half million barrels. Uh, currently, we have about 664. And I'm going to get into this a little bit later. At the beginning of 2017, we had 695, and we sold about 30 million since. And I'll get to that. Um, normally, the idea of here is we're supplying oil into the market during a supply emergency. So who has the authority? Can can me, Doug McIntyre, my boss, go out and decide, oh, we need more oil into the market, let's put it out there. No, of course not. That, that wouldn't be in here. So two people can authorize an emergency release, the president and the secretary. And the president, let's start with him. Um, he has authority to have a full drawdown. There's a supply emergency. Usually, a lot of times, this comes from the International Energy Agency, which implements the International Energy Program, which I mentioned in an earlier slide. Um, he can authorize a full release um, to address a severe petroleum supply interruption or to meet the US obligations under the International Energy Program. And I'll get to the, those obligations in a later slide. Or he can do a limited drawdown which is pretty much the same as the larger one, except it limits the amount of oil that can be put out into the market in the number of days it can, it can cover. The secretary can authorize two other types of sales. One, not a, big, not a really big deal. It's called a test sale. It's up to 5 million barrels only, which is a really small amount. It's designed to just make sure that everything's working right and, and exactly as it says, a test sale. Sometimes it's been used uh, for other purposes, but, but pretty much that's it. But the main reason, the main authority the Secretary has is to, um, to provide refiners a short-term emergency loan to address supply problems. So when would refiners need a, a short-term loan? It's usually following hurricanes. So um, we had an example of of that recently following Hurricane Harvey, which I'll get to. So um, that's when the secretary gets to authorize the release. Now I mentioned the International Energy Program, so let's touch on that. There's two requirements for that, and they're kind of important because that's one of the main missions of, of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is to meet our, our, our requirements for this. So the one requirement that most people talk about is that we need to cover 90 days worth of net imports. So you take your net imports, Let's say they're, you're, you, when you take all the oil that we import, you subtract out how much we export, it's, it's 6 million barrels a day. We need to cover 90 days of that, 6 times 90, 540 million barrels. That's what we would need, okay? But if your net imports are going down, you need less. So that's an easy calculation most people can do, but the whole purpose of that, though, is to lead to the second obligation. That's just to make sure we have enough oil to meet the second obligation, which is this one, to release stocks and share available oil in the event of major supply disruption. This is why we exist, to supply oil and to, to meet a severe supply disruption. So 
there's been times, there's been three times actually in the past where the International Energy Agency has gotten together and they said, okay, we think there's been a severe dis supply disruption. We need all the countries in the IEA to, to provide oil into the market. Well, how do, you, how do we know how much oil we put into the market? Well, they go by the share of your consumption in the IEA. So the U.S. represents 43% currently of IEA consumption, so we would, we would be asked to supply 43% of any collective action. So if they wanted us to put a million, total million barrels into the market, we would supply 43% of that or 430,000 barrels a day. But that, what, this one's the easy one to calculate. This one's a little bit more involved. But we would argue this is just a means to get to the end. This is the key one right here. So let's talk about, let's talk about these releases. Let's first talk about the emergency releases that we've done over the years, which is, again, why we're here. Um, like I said, there's been three international energy agency actions where they got, they got all the countries to agree to release uh, amount into the market. This is the U.S. share. So it's in uh, chronological order from the most recent to the, the one in the past. So uh, three times, uh, kind of like the Arab Spring, this is thought of in 2011, uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and uh, when Saddam went into Kuwait and, and the coalition went, went against Iraq. Now, remember when I mentioned the secretary had, had authority to provide loans to? So here's all the loans that we've done throughout the years. The most recent being Hurricane Harvey. Again, Har Hurricane Harvey hit Texas really hard. It cut off a lot of supply routes to refiners, and a number of them contacted us. We vetted their, that their need was real it was, uh, and, and got the secretary to authorize the release. And how this works is we, we end up loaning out five millions of bar barrels to all the refiners. I say loan because we get paid back in crude oil with a little premium attached to it. When we, when we sign the agreement saying we're going to provide you X amount of oil, the, the contract comes back saying, okay, we're going to get back X amount plus a little bit. This is to cover our costs, and, and this is all defined in, in EPCA. Some other things you might remember, you know, I mean, I think most people here remember Hurricane Katrina. There was an, also major hurricanes in, in 2008. When you see ship channel closure, this, re this refers to the Houston ship channel, which is a major uh, distribution point for uh, the Gulf Coast, but these are all the emergency exchanges SPR has done in the past. Now remember when I talked about um, how we were at 695 million barrels and now we're down at, and now we're down at uh, 665 million barrels? Well, I'm going to get to that in a second, but first I want to talk about a lot of, a lot of has come up. Remember I talked about net oil imports. We have to cover 90 days. So if you look at this slide, um, you can see our net oil imports have dropped suddenly. So if we need to supply 90 days, we need to supply less. We need to have less SPR oil on hand, right? But look, our SPR inventory has, has stayed up high. So there's been some people in the executive branch and in, in, in Congress that have said, well, with our net oil imports down, we don't need as much oil. So we can, we can sell off a lot of the SPR crude oil and still meet our, our IEA requirements. Of course, that's the first requirement. Remember I told you that was the means to an end. So the whole point of this is really to cover possible supply disruptions and you can see there's, uh, this comes from our, our, our colleagues here in the building, our U.S. Energy Information Administration. They do a wonderful uh, report looking at various oil choke, choke points. And you can see that there's a lot of oil. These are million barrels a day of oil floating around going to different parts of the world. And you disrupt any of 
of that flow and you got a sizable disruption in, in, the, in the supply of oil to the world. We may not get any, any of that oil, but another phrase we like to use is a supply disruption anywhere affects prices everywhere. Because it's a global market, even, for example, a major, major oil producing country uh, here is, is uh, Iran, I think, yeah, right I think right there. Um, anyway, we don't get any oil from Iran, but if you lost their four million barrels a day to the world oil market, you would see prices rise everywhere. Why? Because the people who do get oil from Iran would have to suddenly find another source of supply, and then they would then, then those, the people who rely on that supply source now needs to find another supply source, and it just kind of, it's like a domino theory, and you end up, everyone's scrambling. If you have less oil in the bathtub, the price is going to go up. So less oil in the overall market, the prices are going to go up. But what we've seen lately is Congress particularly saying, well, you know, we've got deficits and we have budget issues and we've got this giant asset in the ground that belongs to the government, so let's start, let's start selling it. And, and this isn't, these are the test sales I talked about, you can see that, how they're small, but I just want to focus on these legislative sales. This isn't the first time Congress has done this. If you look at the, down here at the bottom, in the mid-1990s, there was concern about budget, and, and we sold oil for, to raise money uh, to reduce the deficit then. But most recently, we've had a number of, we, we had the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, we've had the budget, Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. We actually have one, one that's already passed that we're going to supply oil way in the future called the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, but, and, and this commonly is referred to as the tax, the recent tax cut and jobs bill act, but this is, uh, actually that's not the official short name, so to keep it official, this is the name of it. But I wanna talk about this one, because if you look at all these, these sales, this one kinda sticks out. This was the most recent uh, budget uh, bill that was just passed, and in it there's section 30204 that says the SPR is going to sell 100 million barrels in the five, in the actually six year period 2022 through 2027. So, um, what that is going to do is ultimately, if you take all these sales into account, by the end of 2027, we would be in the low 400 million barrel range. We're at 665 right now, we were at 694, so it's a substantial reduction, um, but that's if you stop there. Who knows what Congress is going to do. they got an infrastructure bill coming up that they're going to need to pay for that, right, if they do that. So, so we'll see if, if we even stop at this. But this, this last one was uh, the largest that, we, that we've seen. And with that, I'm going to stop, stop there. Um, I'm going to do something that I usually do in my presentations that it's kind of stupid for a government employee, but I leave my contact information at the end of So <clears throat> if you want to contact me uh, after the presentation or any time in the future, have any questions, that's how you reach me. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I, for one, don't like high gas prices, so I really appreciate your insight and work today. Next up is David Nemso, whose presentation is titled, Hoping to Connect, Making Buildings More Social and Smarter. David has more than three decades of industry experience, including running a large state government energy and water department, a prominent bipartisan nonprofit energy efficiency association, and an energy consulting practice. As for his fun fact, David had the longest job title going when he served as the Director General of the North South Wales Department of Energy, Utilities, and Sustainability in Australia, or more conveniently, the DG of Deuce in NSW. Please join me in welcoming David to the stage. Thank you, 
Michelle. Appreciate that. You know, I want to say for the record, I have more fun facts about me, but none that I was willing to share professionally. So I stuck with that one. And um, so I want to talk about something that I think um, I hadn't met Doug before today. I certainly know about, uh, well, I've been doing this so long, Doug, I still call it SPRO instead of SPR. And um, so this is complementary to it in a way. What Doug talked about, of course, is one of the most successful U.S. government energy programs, period, full stop. I think it's up there. Uh, in my mind, and I've been in the energy field since I was an undergraduate, so uh, as I think about this, it's up there with rural electrification, with uh, fuel economy standards, strategic petroleum reserve to help the country and the global economy through thick and thin. I want to talk about something that has no history. It's future looking and doesn't have a proven track record yet. So I hope uh, in five years' time, somebody else, one of my uh, colleagues, can come and give an energy talk and talk, look backwards at some of the success that we will, uh, that we're working on in my office, the Building Technologies Office, which is part of EERE at the uh, department. Which way do I point to, Doug? Right oh, there. So the future shows you what I know about connected. So the future is about connecting things. In, in the course of the time we will be in this room today, about 220,000 objects on Earth will be connected, newly connected for the first time ever to the internet. Some of those are, and that's not even counting phones or computers, that's the everything else. So some of those are uh, smart locks, for example, uh, or smart watches. Uh, some of them are sensors in your car or the factory that you wouldn't even know about. Some are big, some are Fitbit, some are big, some are small. But many of them are in somehow uh, uh, are, are part of our lives. There's a webcam, uh, connected lighting, a smart thermostat. So I'm going to focus on the ones within that that have to do with energy, of course. And uh, my office is responsible for building, so you know, I uh, stole a vehicle. But you know, in my office, we think about refrigerators that uh, that will be connected. Of course, smart thermostats, which are already available. Uh, Forty percent of sales of residential thermostats in this country are already uh, uh, connected to the internet. Uh, lighting, even the pedestrian water heater, which I'll talk about a little later, and of course, solar. So that's, that's what we want to talk about, connected. And, and of course, the world's becoming increasingly connected. So why does that matter to the Building Technologies Office? And uh, since we're part of EERE, we worry about energy efficiency. We're, we're really the building's energy efficiency technologies office. And it's because of few things. One is we, we are, are confident based on what we know so far and our modeling and research that connectivity can help buildings be more energy efficient, that we can take advantage of connectivity to improve our opportunities to save energy in buildings, and two, in a uh, mirror image way, that by making buildings more connected, buildings can connect to the power grid and provide grid services that in the past have only been done, been able to be done at a utility level, but we think that uh, our nation's buildings can help us. I'm gonna, just as an infomercial for buildings, um, we're very competitive in buildings. Buildings is the biggest energy consuming sector in the United States. It's bigger than industry, it's bigger than transportation. The nation's buildings, there's 125 million of them. So there's about 119 million energy consuming residential structures. You think of it as your home, I think of it as an energy consuming structure, and there's another five and a half million uh, commercial uh, buildings in, in this country. And so um, uh, buildings consume about 40% of US energy, a commensurate uh, 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 share of US uh, emissions, but three quarters of US power use, uh, depending on the year. And so that leaves us with a $300 billion annual bill just for powering, heating and cooling, lighting, <coughs> et cetera, our buildings for many, uh, many applications. And, and, and I'm not gonna talk about that except that there's that big gray thing called other uses. And that's everything from plug-in, it's not the big stuff, it's not refrigeration or air conditioning or, or hot water, it's the, it's the miscellaneous stuff. That's not only a big number, it's getting bigger over time. We're making progress with efficiency on the rest of it. Those are going down over time, both on an absolute and a percentage basis there's miscellaneous is going up. I won't talk about that today. Say that for some future time. It's a big bill, and at least a quarter of that's wasted, and, and probably half. So Doug already 
promised you, he told you he was responsible for helping keeping your gasoline prices down, which he is. Uh, so then I think it's fair for uh, say that our office is helping keep your uh, utility bills down. And we do it on natural gas, heating oil, if you're in the Northeast or the Northwest, uh, propane, but I'm gonna focus today on electricity. So first I have to define terms, smartness. Smartness is used different ways in the field. Um, I'm gonna use it meaning the smartness that has the computer capability that we see. And I left my phone there, but the computing capability we see in everything, in your car, in your phone, in your fridge, and all those things. The ability to process, even now a, uh, uh, I mean, you can look around the room, you can see all sorts of things that have a processing capability, uh, unlike what we've seen before. And we've had thermostats for many years. Uh, they used to be called program, PCTs, programmable communicating thermostats. We could, we could, as long as you had a teenager in the house, you could set it uh, for different temperatures that helped save energy. But it didn't, it just talked to the building, right? It talked to the thermostat, talked to your heater or air conditioner. It didn't talk to the rest of the world. So it communicated, but just inside the building. So I'm not, I'm counting that as smartness, but it made decisions. Either you taught it what temperature you like it at different times of day. Should I move it up or down? It's not on. It's not on. I'm a native New Yorker, so I hadn't, I'm good at yelling too. How about now? Is it on? Yes. So uh, we've had thermostats that can talk to the building. Same with lighting. You know, you all have in your offices uh, 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 motion detectors or other ways to control lighting. Um, you even have smart drawer bells, but those those aren't energy savings. They do things, and they they talk to other things. And that was, I, I put it up here to say that a lot of smartness has nothing to do with energy. So I'm going to focus on on our part of it. But what's going forward is not just the smartness, but the connectedness, in which uh, these devices can talk to the outside world, typically through the internet. And there have been different technologies available over the years, but certainly Wi-Fi is the most common for residential and small commercial purposes. For other applications, cellular, and especially as the uh, 5G gets developed, will be uh, much more appealing. And there's other protocols, Bluetooth and Zigbee. So that thermostat that you used to control yourself now, go out and buy a, a, an Ecobee or a Nest or a Honeywell, it talks to the world. And that means it can understand weather patterns. It means you can control it remotely should you choose to do that. Uh, similarly with lighting and, and all sorts of other equipment. Why do we want to do this? Because energy efficiency can not only save energy and save money and make energy more affordable for Americans, but it can help the power grid. So you know the power grid, if you look at power demand over time, this is just a schema. In the course of the day, uh, power demand goes up in the country, people come to work, some of the, you leave stuff on at home, you turn on lights and things, and then if it's summertime, um, air conditioning goes on. And when your air conditioning goes on, your air conditioning guns and yours go on. Your fridges may all be doing their own thing, but we all use air conditioning at roughly the same time in areas, so we get a peak demand. And we have to build that power system to, um, uh, to get to serve the peak. So by energy efficiency, what we can do is lower that demand and that's uh, very important to help relieve stress and strain on the power system. We can also smooth it. We can change the shape of it. If we can focus our efforts on the peak, then we can lower the time when we need the most power plants and the most transmission and distribution. So that's what we're going to try to do with connectedness. It matters what time of day it is. So it, to save, it costs different amounts of money to generate electric power at different times of the day. You don't see it. Some people, anybody here have a time of use power rate at home? Pepco does it usually on a voluntary basis. Only about 2% of Americans see time of use rates, but unlike the airfares or uh, uh, HOVs, um, uh, you don't see it, but it happens. So, as I said, you have to build the system to meet the peakiest of demand. So this is Massachusetts. It could be just about anywhere in the country. Air conditioning defines the peak in, in uh, over 90% of the country. And so that means we're building the system uh, to meet the demand, not for that exit sign, which is on 24-7, but to meet that peaky demand. And because um, that's the time when it's the most expensive to generate, that's the time when it's most valuable to save. So this is 
For, this is just saving the same amount of power, one megawatt hour. This is an analysis that we commissioned at Berkeley Lab. Just to save one megawatt hour, the value of it is much greater during these peaky times than during these average times. And if you break that down, it's because they all save energy. Anytime you save energy, you're saving money on your coal or, or, or gas or whatever's going into the power plant. But when you save it at peak, you're also saving money, if you look at the color code, on the transmission system, on the distribution system, and on the capacity of power plants. So that's what we want to focus on time. And I think you can see where I'm going with this, and that's why connectivity matters, because it, it allows us to communicate with those energy consuming equipment to reflect that. This is something called demand response, which I'll just say quickly. All it shows is um, uh, FERC uh, c many years ago looked at what's the uh, potential for it. Only 6% of customers on the commercial side and 7 on residential are participating, leading to big savings. But look at the light green that's left to go. And you could do the same for any of our fields. So I, I, I'm going to talk uh, about grid interactive efficient buildings, very poetically known as GEBS. Uh, in our office, and it's again to have buildings to be connected. So let me give you an example. This is uh, this is a this is a grid. You got buildings, right? You got your your uh, a, a big commercial space um, uh, that uh, and you have your your distributed or centralized power plants. All right, that's the world, or that's the future world. So the world we want to have is one that's more interactive, more transactive, is is a term we use in our field. And so the ISO, the ISO is the independent system operator. That's the, par the party that controls uh, uh, the grid around here. It's the PJM one, and there's, there's uh, uh, I want to say, nine of them uh, around the country um, that control their local grid. They might communicate a price that's saying it's a hot summer day, and uh, uh, there's about to be a price increase. Again, not for the people, not for residential. You don't see it based on a time-sensitive basis, but for the big users who will see those kinds of prices unless there's some relief on the system. So they send that signal out, and then, for example, this is supposed to be a hotel. Well, this hotel says, I'm not cutting my demand. I got a big conference in town. We need all the air conditioning we can. Forget it. We're not interested. But they know they're going to get a price increase because, we're, because the system's about to be strained. If we can have this world of transactive controls and communicative controls that we're trying to build, they can send out a uh, message which hopefully works better than the pointer. Can we do it any other way? Yeah. Um. There's a rule, and it's just now I'll make this a serious point. When things get more complicated, they are more likely to, to get in trouble. So, uh, look, buildings have been, while we do this, I'll just say this, buildings have been connected to the power grid since 1882. That's when Thomas Edison built the uh, Pearl Street Station in New York and, and connected, did, built, so buildings have always been connected. That's not what's new. What's new is that they can be connected using uh, the internet, using modern communications, and in and, and, and a two-way interactive way with uh, uh, communications and price signals. Can we just, um, does the right arrow option work? And I'll just, I'll holler when it's done. Is it reboot time? Not going forwards or backwards. This is working, so the battery's not completely dead if that's what it was, but it sounds like it's frozen. So probably in the interest of time, should I just do a voiceover and, and we'll go from there, Michelle? What, what do you recommend? You might want to. Is your computer on or no? The other lesson is always bring hard copy. So I won't do that, but just to make sure I cover all the points. Uh, sorry, and especially if you're remote, I know uh, you, know, you have it up, Robbie, or? So I'll say this. So, you, so what we want to do is communicate. So if, if this hotel uh, isn't willing to do it, perhaps this building over here, whatever that schema is, can. And if they can send a signal 
in a transactive signal, this building, the owner may voluntarily wish to transact and say, okay, I'm doing my thing, but I will shed some load because I don't have a big conference. I'm really going to hurt me. I'll make some money on the side. So that's already being done, but we wanted to do it in more of an iterative way. Uh, Doug already made, uh, already commented that he works in Forest Hall. I, I work in L'Enfant Plaza, um, so I don't really care if Forest Hall gets two degrees warmer. Is that okay? And uh, most of you probably work here. And so if, if within buildings, if it's two degrees, you probably notice it as a person. But if it's a degree, you probably don't notice it. And you can do it for a short while. Buildings are very good at coasting. The light doesn't coast. You turn off the light, you notice it immediately. But if the temperature changes or the hot water temperature changes, you don't notice it so much. Good. Thanks. So that's what this is about. The modern power grid, uh, the one that Thomas Edison helped build, looks like this. It's centralized. It goes out. It works quite well. It's quite affordable. And we have some issues of uh, reliability, but it works quite well. The future grid, the one that the department uh, through the Grid Modernization Initiative and uh, uh, many offices within the department as well as, of course, utilities and states, uh, commissions around the country and many others are trying to create a more interactive world like this in which there are more power plants in more places, more distributed renewables such as solar and wind, electric vehicles, and again, that buildings can be part of that mix, not just passive consumers, but can provide services uh, back and forth. And so I'm, I'm, in the interest of time, I'll skip some of our, our research in this area. Uh, as I say, it's part of the Grid Modernization Initiative that uh, 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 has been a priority. You can see that in the budget request. And um, uh, to make sure that buildings are part of that active grid. They're, they're not as active as a, a natural gas power plant. You can't throttle them up and down that way. But remember what I said, there's 125 million buildings consuming 40% of our nation's power and three quarters of our nation's electricity. So we don't have to use them all. Nobody's saying turn up or down the hospital water heater to save a, a few thousand dollars. But we are saying that if enough buildings can do it in enough hours, it can be a dispatchable resource. And that's what we're doing. This is just a schema just to show that uh, it works in two, just to show two dimensions from things within buildings devices, equipment, components, all the way to whole regions. And from uh, sub-seconds, which if you're a utility planner, matters. For the rest of us, it doesn't matter so much to days and years. Uh, this is our uh, research program, um, uh, focusing on the different elements of making buildings more responsive, more flexible, more interactive. This is the end state. This is the world we're trying to get to and we're trying to contribute to. So again, I, th I want to thank the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for all of what they've done and will do in the future. And again, I hope someday uh, uh, my colleagues and I can come back and boast about the uh, world that buildings and the rest of DOE has helped create. Thanks very much. Coming up, Doug. Thank you, David. I, too, am a fan of lower utility bills as I am of lower <laughs> gas prices. We're playing to our audience, right? <laughs> Before we say goodbye to folks watching on our live stream, I want to give a shout out to our March 13th program. I certainly hope you'll be able to join us on March 13th. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to us at energytalks at ee.doe.gov. And we'd like to now open things up to questions from the audience. If you have any questions in the audience, please go to the standing mics and ask your questions there. Hey there, um, I'm Drew Bittner from EE. Um, David, Doug, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it, and it was really informative. So I think it was a good talk. Um, my first question would be to to David. Um, when I think of smart buildings, I kind of think of the home that the Jetsons lived in. You know, it's like highly mechanized. Everything is voice controlled. Everything is, you know, um, the furniture moves itself. That sort of thing. Um, the the thing that we don't think about, I guess, is how vulnerable those might be to um, cybersecurity issues, things like that, because of course, if it's online, it can get hacked. So 
what are any issues on your mind in terms of security, resilience, being able to um, basically, I guess, stop an emergency as it's occurring to prevent ho homes from being shut off, you know, and, and so on? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. It is a very important one. And uh, again, if you look at the uh, President's new budget request, you see the increased emphasis for, for the entire department on this. You also let me uh, give me a chance to use my prop, which I didn't use. So first, before we talk about homes, let me just talk about commercial size building. This is a, a microprocessing board. If you can't see it, that's part of the propness. I want to show you how small it is. And it's just a, it's a microprocessor with a micro USB in back, and it also has uh, uh, um, a Wi-Fi capability. So this can control a building, uh, not quite as big as Forest Hill, as big as, let's say, half a lawn font uh, north or south. That's that many square feet. It has embedded in it some software that was developed by the Pacific Northwest National Lab in coordination with BTO called Voltron. Voltron was built from the bottom up to be cyber secure. And that's because this is, this is your question spot on. As more and more things are connected, there are more and more ways for people, either bad people to get in or careless people. But it's really bad people taking advantage of, of careless people. So software uh, uh, solutions such as Voltron is one of many are essential to that. Um, but I do want to say this. Part of the problem is, and it gets back to uh, connected doorbells and connected baby monitors, are not within the scope of responsibilities of the Department of Energy, let alone the Building Technologies Office. So we need to work, as we are working hand in glove within different parts of the officer, uh, sorry, DOE are working together, vehicles, buildings, uh, uh, et cetera, but we need to work elsewhere because connectivity is connectivity, right? So my sh short version is it's a real threat. We're working on it, but it's, it, 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 we're, it, we're not going to solve it in one step, right? It's going to be a, it's a war, a constant war. But I do want to also mention resilience. Resilience has a couple of different meanings. There's the Katrina kind of uh, meeting that, uh, meaning that we think about a lot, and we just saw it with Hurricane Maria, of course. But there's another meaning to resilience and reliability, and that is what I was trying to focus on, if we can lower stress on the power system, lower peak demand, it's less likely that it will trip out. That doesn't help you with hurricanes or natural disasters or, 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 or terrorist disasters, but it does help you with, with um, uh, when things trip out due to a heat wave. So energy efficiency in general and, and connected efficiency in particular can make a very meaningful contribution there. So uh, the short answer is all of the above. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, my second question would be, um, I live in a condo that was built in the mid-60s, and a lot of the controls in the building are hardwired and very old and out of date. What do you see as the opportunities to retrofit or upgrade existing buildings like that to take advantage of the technologies we have now? Um, I, I, I'm going to punt on that one. Look, first, you, you know, houses are typically last in this country, you know, 50, 100 years, and, and commercial space can be quite long, too. So that's a, one of the biggest challenges we face in energy efficiency, that these decisions last a long time. So that's, this is how we toss and turn at night, of course, right, worrying about older buildings. On this, I would say the field of connectivity and using it for uh, 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 energy efficiency and for grid services is new enough and burgeoning enough we're not going to worry about your condo yet, and that's the punt here. We, we, need, to, we need to develop these applications, cyber secure, uh, connected otherwise, in new buildings, new lighting systems, LED, et cetera, and then we're going to get to retrofit. So that's, that's a way of saying I don't know, and, and, and we're, not going to, we're not going to think about it for a little while. Gotcha. I can talk to you about traditional energy <laughs> efficiency in your condo through windows, and uh, we're developing new insulation that uses nanoparticles that's particularly suitable for uh, retrofit applications, but that's a different energy talk, right? Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Doug, I had a question for you, too. Um, we've seen that there are disruptions due to wars, primarily in the Middle East, and also due to natural disasters, primarily that are domestic. What's the worst case situation? that SPR contemplates, and how much do you think the SPR could alleviate a really catastrophic failure of the international oil supply? Great, excellent questions. So um, anyone that's in the oil market for any length of time, um, their largest fear is a closure of the Strait of Hormuz. Um, if 
if we uh, went back to one of those slides that showed all the barrels that were flowing around, there was one that showed 19.0, if you remember, right smack in the middle. Well, that's how much is approximately coming out of the Strait of Hormuz going everywhere. Uh, a lot of that oil is coming from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran. All the big players, a lot of that oil is coming through a relatively narrow body of water. So it makes it vulnerable to, uh, there's, in, in fact, there's uh, always concern about um, just, just cutting out, you know, just putting the, the pl things in place to keep the oil from coming out of there. Um, now, if that were to happen, the IEA would probably institute a collective action, ask for us to, to draw down as much oil as we can. Currently, our maximum design capacity is 4.4, roughly 4.4 million barrels a day. So that would cover roughly a IA collective action of about 10 million barrels, because remember, we're about 43%. So um, if it was larger than 10 million barrels, then we're probably not going to be able to cover it. Um, there's also issues related to how quickly we can get that oil out into the market without disrupting other, other oil that's already flowing through those pipelines because we're putting our oil into the same pipeline system that the, the country has. So, but um, that's the largest, that's, that's the biggest fear. Fortunately, it's never happened. Uh, there was concern about that when Iraq invaded Kuwait and we formed a coalition to kind of make sure that didn't happen. Uh, but that's the that's the biggest concern. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Rob Merriam with U.S. Energy Information Administration. I enjoyed both of your presentations. Thank you. My question's for Doug. Two-part question. <clears throat> First, so um, could you clarify when you're talking about uh, the uh, the need to have reserves to cover 90 days worth of um, supply. Are we just talking about crude oil or are we talking about uh, crude oil and other products that the U.S. Uh, imports and exports? And the second part of the question is if it is the latter or it isn't the latter, does the Petroleum Office have a position on whether it should be the latter, meaning it should count, you know, determine the 90 days of supply using all petroleum products or just can focus on crude oil? Sure, good question. So the 90-day requirement, remember, comes from the International Energy Agency. Uh, to be a member of the International Energy Agency, you need to meet that requirement. So they set the, the definition of that requirement. It does include all petroleum, so it includes crude oil, gasoline, <coughs> diesel fuel, jet fuel. It, it even includes uh, the, the favorite uh, EIA product of petroleum coke. So it includes anything that you can possibly think of uh, related to petroleum. Um, and, and, uh, and they calculate the amount, but that chart that I showed included all petroleum, crude oil. And so uh, I think that alleviates me having to answer the second question. Hi, I'm Bob Schmidt in the policy office for Doug. There was a release in 2000 of 30 million barrels, and that was under the balancing category, which was as large as any of the internationally directed drawdowns. I was just curious what that was. Was that like Y2K or something? No, no, that was, uh, that was leading up into the winter of 2000. Um, there was concern that there wasn't going to be enough heating oil. Heating oil inventories had been drawn down the previous winter. Um, they didn't refill uh, very much during the summer, and so heading it, so people just experienced a very cold winter. They were heading into an, another winter uh, with the expectation that it could be cold again and inventories weren't there. So um, I actually remember, because uh, I was here at the time uh, with EIA, but the secretary uh, called in a bunch of refiners and said, we really need you to help, help us through the situation by making more heating oil to lead into the winter and, and we're gonna help you by releasing some, some crude oil that you can then, then purchase and refine and turn into heating oil and gasoline and all the other products that they normally do. Now, in fairness, uh, there was another 
group of, of, of folks that said, well, that just happened to coincide right before an election. And maybe there was some political motivation behind that. I'm not going to answer that one way or the other, but I'm, I'm just going to tell you uh, what happened in, in that other side that might have had some influence. Sure. So I'm Jen Rivers in the ERE. Thank you both for your presentations. I enjoyed them both. Um, my question is for David. You mentioned um, how these smart buildings can save us energy and therefore money, which I definitely appreciate. What's the incentive on the, um, the uh, side of the suppliers? Uh, I think traditionally the model has been you sell more energy, you transmit more energy, and you get paid more. So what are the incentives that you guys are looking at in your office for those folks? Uh, that's a good question, and it's a tough one. Can we, uh, can we go back a couple of slides, or is it too late for that? So the, the reason I was going to show it to you graphically, so now we're going to get into uh, thinking about w the uh, 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 distribution of costs and benefits among different parties. So again, for most uh, uh, electric consumers in this country, uh, residential and small business almost exclusively, they don't see a time-sensitive electric rate. You see the same thing. But what that means is for the utility company, the ones who have to uh, require to provide that power, they're, you know, they make different amounts of money at different times of the day because they're paying a time-sensitive rate that varies based on the system. So during those peak periods, they're probably losing money on every sale. They have to as part of their legal obligation to serve their, their base, and then they make up, the, if things work right, they make up the money the rest of the year. But you can see where I'm going with this. Their self-incentive within a, a, a regulatory regime is true. If they can trim sales during that peak period when they're losing money and increase sales in the period when they're making money, they'll be ahead. So their incentives and the end, use and center, end users and centers are aligned pretty well in those peak times. Um, doesn't mean you don't have to deal with the regulatory signals uh, uh, and the technological uh, option. It's the, it's the, uh, so that's part of it. The rest of the year, they, their uh, incentives are not aligned. And uh, this, is, this is one of the key issues within energy efficiency generally. A lot of states led by California and now, uh, I don't remember the number, but quite a few states have regulatory regimes in which they, they have very complex uh, systems in which they try to reward utilities for saving energy not discourage them. It works to different degrees, but the bottom line is the, in the uh, incentives for saving are split all over the place. That's just between utility and end user. Remember, if you're in a, a commercial building or resident, if you're a renter in either a commercial or residential building, you have another, right? Uh, uh, another challenge, the owner, the tenant, and the utility. If you're in a commercial building, you probably have a building manager who's different than the owner, who's different than the tenant, let alone from the utility, let alone from the access. So it, it's, it's a big problem, and the biggest part of the problem is even when the many times, and we only work on efficiency if it's cost effective, but even if it's cost effective as a whole, a single party might have a negative incentive. It might not be good for them, and uh, they, they may not have the incentive. So it's, it's, a, um, it, it's a hard one. Are there any easy questions today? <laughs> <laughs> it's a smart group. Yeah. Is that it? Well, that's all that we have time for today. Thank you so much to Doug and David for presenting for us today. And please join us on March 13th for another Energy Talks. Thank you.